Arrays aren't the only way that we can store multiple values that we can index into with integers and their positions are kind of tell you where they are in, in there. We also have lists and lists vary from arrays in a number of significant ways that we'll see. The biggest one is that lists are immutable. So just like with an array, we have a simple syntax for making a list. We say list with a capital L and then we give the values that we want to store. This is one way that we can make a list. Once again, Scala will infer the type for you. You can specify it if you want, but there's generally no need to do so. And they don't all have to be ints. We could make a list of strings just as we could have made an array of strings. Any type that we have, we could store inside of a list or an array. In the case of a list, there's actually a different way that we can build lists, and that's because lists allow you to very efficiently add things onto the front of them. Now, if we give a name to a list, so I'll create a variable called LST, and it will be a list that stores those values, I can use an operator that's referred to as cons to prepend, and that is to stick to the front of that list. And so the cons operator is a two colons stuck together. I didn't have to put spaces here, but I, I did for readability. So this is one read as one cons list, and you can see that we get back a list that has a one in front of it. The thing to note here is that our original list is not modified, it's still there. This created a new list for us. And because of the way that these lists work, this was an efficient way to, or an efficient thing to do. Now using this cons operator, we could also build a list by consing things onto a list with no elements. And in fact, there is a name for just such a thing. It's called nil. And so one way that we could build a list is to cons various elements onto nil. So one cons two, cons three, cons four, cons nil gives us the same list that we could get by typing in list one, two, three, four. Depending upon what you're doing, you might find one syntax or the other to be more beneficial. Uh, most of the time, if you know all the elements, you'll use this approach, but if you are building things kind of one element at a time, this is the approach that, that generally works better. The fact that these things are immutable, so I can index into a list. So let's remind ourselves what LST looks like. I can pull up element sub two. It's worth noting this isn't an efficient thing to do with lists, so we won't do it that much, but it works. And so that gives me back the element three there. However, unlike the array, I cannot assign into the list. Okay, so you don't have the ability to to do to update values inside of a list because once again it is immutable. So we can take this information and we can build a nice little recursive function. It's going to be similar to the fill array, except in some ways it's more useful. It actually allows us to build up a list. And so let's write a file called list functions and define input list. In this case, I'm going to make it so that the user, the person calling our code, tells us how many values they want in the list. And we are going to return a list of integers. Because I'm inputting things, I am going to import IO stdin dot underscore. So what is our base case? Well, if n is less than one, so if we're supposed to read in fewer than one things, well, then we shouldn't read in anything. And that means we need to return an empty list. As we just saw, there's a nice name for that. So we'll just give back nil. What if we want more than one element? So else. Well, in that case, we should read a value, 
and then we should take that value and cons it on to the rest of the values. Once again, we're thinking recursively here. So we think of it as this case and then do the rest of the cases. And that is simply our recursive call input list of n minus one. We're counting down towards zero. So we would get zero elements in the end. And we can test this out by calling input list. We'll read in a list with five elements and we'll just stick that in, well, let's give it a name. Val st equals print line lst. Remember the arrays did not print nicely. It turns out that lists do print nicely. So if we run Scala on the list functions here, it's going to sit there and wait for me to type in five values. One, two, three, four, five. And sure enough, we get back the list. One, two, three, four, five. So in the case of lists, lists work very well when you don't know how many things you're going to need up front. The array is best if you do know how many things, and of course the array does allow you to nicely mutate them. The list, we're not able to mutate them, but because we can efficiently cons onto the front of the list, it makes it very easy for us to build up a list when we didn't know in advance how many things we we're going to, to want. In this case, because I passed in the end, we did know, but to make this you know, more relevant, we could have had a function like what we've done before, where the user types in quit or a negative value, and we stop there. In that case, we truly don't know how many values are going to be in the list until the user tells us that they're, that they're done typing things in, and that is an area where the list will work very well for us.